needs to go near the start because you're excited to work on that. Just because we work on it first doesn't mean it has to go first. That's true. But wouldn't, okay, that's true. I right. actually kind of like it towards the middle ish yeah, end. I, I would agree. You want it to keep getting better and better. You want a really great start. The first two tables basically need to be something to hook you in. You definitely want the last three to build in amazingness. It feels like our best one. I agree. To I, and to me, it's, it's also there's a lot going on in it. So I wouldn't want to throw that to someone the very first one. Right. It's like to let them get into the rhythm of it and then yeah. you, you hit them with a more complicated one, right? Yeah. This accident machine needs to be the first accident related thing. When they see this one, the accident maze, they're not going to be expecting an accident because there's been no other accidents until now. And we've also got the, um, the laptop being covered in liquid. You know, we've just destroyed a laptop. All bets are off. We could destroy anything. So you're saying this one comes first. Mm -hmm. And then laptop liquid comes later. Do we want to do the accident ones kind of back to back or? It's a good question. We could. Space them out a little bit. Let's think about that. So we would probably go accident maze and then pulling out the tablecloth. I, yeah, I'd, I'd say back to back because you get into the flow of the accident. Okay. This one doesn't really have any danger on the line. This isn't like destroying anything. Correct. So this is a good start one. Then this one's like destroying some dishware, and then we got the laptop. And the laptop. So that's, that's the finale. And then from then, there... This can be in either order. I like the idea of this one kind of being last, because it's like cake. It's like food extravaganza, yeah. dessert. You have dessert at the end, right? Yeah. And it seems like kind of what everything's leading up to, almost. Yeah. It feels like, okay, here's all food, and it's like a super complex thing. So this is our temporary order. I think it's clumps of things, honestly, at this yeah. point. That seems about right. Is for these four to be yeah. the start in some order. Yeah. So after these four, it's the four accident ones, things involving destruction or unexpected results. And then we've got the finale ones, which are yeah. really complex machinery. And then of course, we what we don't have here are the, the intro, whatever the net clip is that moves the net, yeah. and the actual finale thing with the potted plant that actually puts the pepper on. This is, this is pretty crazy. This is a lot more mental than the past the salt was. I think so. We were racking our brains for quite a while as to what would actually be a good launching mechanism. We really like this idea of using tongs. Um, so we actually went out and bought these, but they aren't strong enough by themselves. So we were also thinking of using some kind of slingshot technique with this rubberized rope. And then we combined both of those two concepts together to make a slingshot tongs launcher weight goes off the table. The idea is that when the shaker goes in, it presses down just enough to dislodge the nail. Okay, we've also got this curtain here for as, as a precautionary measure, so hopefully what will happen is, are you ready? Yeah. So we don't break the paper shaker. Yeah, or the wall. So, here we go, are you ready? Ready. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Oh, this will work. I can feel it. Ready. Ready. <laughs> uh -oh. Okay. Oh my oh god. My god. <laughs> All right, let's stop. 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 stop it. <laughs> Here we go. Ready? Yep. Whoa! That's amazing. So it's going to roll in. Yeah. That's beautiful. Oh god. Yum, food is delicious. <laughs> wow, that was amazing. Um, and then eventually this will be back here, something in place, and then I grabbed this. Perfect. And then, and then that gets launched. Yeah, it gets launched. I feel like the hardest part is going to be the human interaction. Reaching for the wine glass, having the accident, and then not looking at the machine as it's working. Remembering to take a sip, place the wine glass down, and grab the salt all while looking natural. But I think the mechanics of everything, clearly, 
work great. Yeah. Oh, the original plan for this, you're going to like this. The original plan was to take the pepper shaker, bounce it off of a drum, and then it would land into a funnel. And then basically that and this would be connected. So it would go to a funnel and then immediately just land into the launcher. I love the intro, especially this sort of weird accident thing. We're basically making sure that it's not going to shake too much when the launcher goes. Come on. Oh. So it didn't work. Whoa! <laughs> we are about to film the first shot of Pass the Pepper. So Lyle's gonna sit here. We've um, dressed everything, so we've got some pictures on the walls, a clock. We put this bread here so it looks more tabley. To elaborate a little bit along the lines of like how many steps it is to actually get ready to film. All our time has been spent deciding what the food is going to be. <laughs> Most importantly, the pepper needs to be very clearly visible. Not in this shot, but in the final shot when the machine puts pepper on the food. Like that's the money shot. So I know just... what you're thinking, like, but this isn't the final shot though, who cares? But if the food doesn't match, what kind of dinner is that? Yeah, exactly. We've also spent time putting these little decals on the pepper and the salt so that they're instantly recognizable without really anyone having to think. They just communicate pepper, you know? Mm -hmm. Especially because this is going to turn up again halfway through and we want people to remember it. So we've made something sort of ideally memorable. We've got this real wine glass with fake wine, which is just real grape juice. The plan is to film the close-up angle today and then take this entire table and swing it around this way and film it against this back wall. Because when you go back like this, you see part of the workbench. Yeah. Hopefully no one will notice. This is one of the problems with working in New York in a small apartment is that it's like a juggling act. Every single shot, you have to move everything around so that you can get one tiny little corner of the room that has no shit in the background. So you may have assumed that since this intro clip involves this crazy launch of a pepper shaker into the metal funnel, that it would have taken a ton of tries to get this to work properly. And you'd be right, except not for the reason you think. You see, the launch itself is actually very reliable. It's just that the P on the pepper shaker never landed facing the camera. So we had to do this over 70 times before the P actually landed the proper way around. This wine bottle is not actually filled with wine or any liquid actually, it's filled with sand. Because sand is really the only thing we could find that would be heavy enough to launch the pepper shaker off of the spatula. The other benefit is that if this bottle were to somehow break, we wouldn't have liquid going everywhere. Sand is also kind of annoying to clean up, but wine would have destroyed this machine. So the trick to the vase mechanism is that the vase is heavier in the base. I filled it with uh, some epoxy resin so up to about there, so it's got a nice heavy bottom and it also helps it swing up to land on its top. But it doesn't totally stay up, it keeps wanting to fall down. So it's also got a magnet taped to the bottom here, which means if I do that over another surface that has another magnet taped to the bottom, then it's going to want to stay up more easily. And there's another trick, so there's a ball hidden in the vase the whole time and then at the very end this rolls and the ball comes out and the trick for that was that these little flowers have two tiny little magnets hidden in them and those magnets stick to a metal plate and that ensures it always lands the right way. This is a cucumber slicer contraption. It's in a very rough form. As you can see it looks hideous right now but it's just kind of a proof of concept. We want to see if we can chop the cucumber and then have it roll off at two different angles and two halves and then watch what happens when it hits this little wire down there. So these two bits of uh, pipe pivot like that and then tip. You need that twist because otherwise the two halves are going to roll and they're still going to be sort of touching each other in the middle and jamming against each other. So by twisting them out from each other they roll away from each other a bit. Okay, here we go. Uh, it's not heavy enough. It's so close. That is really close. <laughs> we got one! No. No. So I'm trying to find um, 
as many like straight cucumbers as possible for this machine. But most cucumbers are not straight. Not good enough. Maybe. They also need to be 12 inches long. Just 13 inches, that's fine. Between 11 and 13 is ideal. Why are cucumbers not straighter? Like, they're clearly not growing them very efficiently. Okay, so this is a bit of a fail, Lyle. I uh -huh. think that we need to rethink this. Sunken cost. Sunken cost, yeah. I spent so long on it that I feel like at a certain point I was like, well, I've already spent so long on this. I don't want <laughs> that time to all be wasted, so I just got to keep going. And then it gets worse and worse because you end up spending longer and longer and don't want to stop even more. But we kind of need to because it's not really if it's going to work. I mean, maybe if we get a hundred cucumbers. What are the main issues? There's like a million issues, really. The salary is deteriorating as we film. So like this track stops working. Let's see if it's working right now. See, now it's stopped working because the salary has gotten soft. The cucumbers don't always get sliced through. They roll at different angles. We've had several issues at the beginning before the cucumber even gets chopped with it getting, with it not getting released or not pushing the first knife or jumping over the barrier. Those are really fixable things, but the more important issues are the ones that are just sort of seemingly fundamental issues with design. Yeah. And not just, oh, that was unlucky. So what do you want to do? Because of sunk costs. Ideally, we don't throw the whole thing out. What were you saying before, your idea about changing the second half? What if you only did one chop? Like you just kept the first half, uh -huh. where it goes across when it's against the first one, chops it once, mm -hmm. and then you just end it. Like it goes into two halves, and then you know, maybe the two halves do something, but that's it. It doesn't chop it again. That was enough trouble as it is. Yeah. To get that to work. We yeah. did get there though, so it's possible. Yeah. The they two can halves just... can roll into other little small cucumbers. Oh, that'd so be cute. Two little tracks completed in the same way that you had that first track. It's like mirroring the start. In yeah. a way, that's more elegant than having the celery. We have this idea of cooking spaghetti for one of the tables. Uh, we don't really know how it's going to behave, so this is just kind of the testing phase. So I've been kind of just putting it in and seeing how it behaves. Obviously, it's going to cook. The idea that I had was have two rails like this and ball rolls across them, like track, and then they dip into the water, cook for a little while, but then when they come back out, the, t the part that was submerged in the water is now soft and droopy. Yeah. So the rails are effectively shorter. This is kind of fun for me, like when you don't really know what to do yet, but you've got some objects. One strategy I like to use is to forget for a moment about the machine and what we're trying to do and what the balls are going to do and everything. And just literally just sort of play around with pasta like you're a kid. And then you get to like know the material, right? And you yeah. get to like, you're comfortable with it. And then often you find these weird things that you never thought you'd find. And they end up being like the centerpiece. The classic spaghetti test is throw it against the wall, if it sticks, it's done cooking. So we thought, okay, well, if it can stick to something and maybe pull something, then that would be a cool trick. When you throw it at the wall, you throw it really hard, and that's what allows it to stick. Oh, Lord. I've definitely done this with success in the past. <laughs> Where did the toaster? I think this is a great idea. I think you should do it. But all the stuff's happening in quite a small area, and kind of far from the camera. We want it to be clear what's happening at all times, so it's just designing, really thinking about the design so that we don't end up with tons of like infrastructure crowding out the action. Today, I am frustrated because we are trying to make a spaghetti holder, which you'd think would be quite easy, but really hard. Ow! And I just cut myself. Yeah. I'm having a bad day. It's been long and miserable yeah. and filled with pasta shards. And then this works. Domino on the edge. And then make sure this is down all the way. Put a weight at the end. Comes down, rolls across the spaghetti, knocks the domino off. Wow, that's great. This goes into there for later. Metal ball goes into the cup to lead to the spatula. And pasta goes into the pot to cook for 10 minutes. So this turns the clock on. Awesome. Oh, that is.
was thoroughly disappointing. I don't know how I'm gonna do it yet. And then the ball goes zoop, 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 and somehow releases the two that landed in here. Because the third one missed, but those ones did not. I feel like you've never done anything like this before. That's right. There's a regular machine that just looks intentional. That's a regular generic machine. And then there's an accident that is clearly intentionally made in real life, but is played as if it's some kind of accident within the narrative. And it happens in comedy all the time, really. Someone will like accidentally fall over and break something that's really important in the storyline. And then, then right. and we know as an audience that that wasn't really an accident, that it was filmed and it's fiction, right? right and it's but scripted. in the world of the story, it's, it is a true accident. Yeah, so basically scripting an accident, but yeah. having a machine that scripts an accident. Yeah. And then this is a totally different thing that's both an accident, or it's an accident, it's not really an accident. It looks like it's it is. It's made to look, you're just messing with people's, uh, with the viewer, because it's made to look like an accident. I still haven't fully wrapped my head around this whole, this whole concept. It's just obviously designed to work properly, but even within the narrative, it's also designed to work. It's also yeah. not an accident within the narrative. It's mm -hmm. designed to have this particular moment where it looks like it has failed. Yeah. But crucially, you have to make the audience realize that it wasn't actually a yeah. fail. Because we've made this machine to pass paper, so if it truly messed up and there was an accident, then it wouldn't work, and we wouldn't, I wouldn't get the paper, and that would be a different story. It's not the story we're telling. Right. Ultimately, we're telling the story of a successful paper passing machine. People will know, no matter what, that it was designed to work that way, yeah. but if you somehow convey that within the story it's an accident, that also doesn't work. That's the big thing you try yeah, to avoid. Yeah, yeah is you have to make it evident that it is actually designed that way in the story yeah, as yeah, well, yeah. while still having that weird moment of people yeah. second-guessing it. Yeah, exactly. The trick in the mechanical elements alone, the track, the ball, the cups, nothing's super, super themed yet. So it's crucial that it still looks like a kitchen or dinner table setting. Yeah, you can't have dinner-themed balls. You can't really have dinner-themed tracks. So the only option is that these things are Dinner objects. Dinner themed supports. Look at that. I think it's gonna work. I do too. Yes. The ball doesn't actually go in the, the last cup. It establishes the pattern like, oh, ball in cup, ball in cup, ball almost in cup. And maybe once you realize that everything was just a series of tracks, you start thinking, oh, maybe the cup's not gonna get used. But then it does get used and then it's carrying this red ball that's hidden from the camera view. We were both like, oh, what are we going to do here? What are we going to do here? And we kept being like, well, there's this handy little yellow box that's not in use. Is there something we can do with it? And then every now and then we'd think about that and then forget it. I was like, well, we could do a track here but, and hide the ball. But then you were like, yeah, but I was like, but you'll see the ball. And you were like, well, we could cut a hole in the book. And then <laughs> those two ideas combined. From the front, we wanted it to look as unsuspicious as possible. So we've kind of hidden all the little tricks and hinges and things, which I'll explain to you now. Watch this ball. It's gonna knock out that domino, which is very precariously placed there, which will make the whole thing collapse. Now the trick is hinges and magnets. See this track, it's hinged there, it swivels as well. And then there's a big block of magnets here, which sticks to a magnet under here that locks into place. And over here we have a magnet too, so watch the way this sticks. This is really stuck here, like all of these tracks, magnets, hinges, so the ball always rolls down each track. This one has hinges at both containers because it's straight, it stays straight that way. The other ones have to actually twist in a little bit. You can see the middle one is straight and these two like become angled. So to really sell this as like a true accident, we wanted to add sort of like extra chaos to it because the hinges are very precise on their own. But by adding a few like random elements, so there's a stack of dominoes under here. So when this collapses, they just go willy nilly. There's like a hidden domino just sitting here at the back ready to bounce and go somewhere. 
It doesn't serve any purpose other than to create a larger sense of chaos. Similarly, this track over here collapses for no reason. It just adds to the chaos. There is one other collapse that's actually very important. So the black ball that goes in this cup at the start is reused as the ball that rolls down all three tracks. So to release it, we have this very precise, once again, a hinge. You can see there's a wire here. When this third track hits here, it's going to push on the wire and the ball will get released. Perfect. So the way this works is this is full of liquid and there's a ball hidden inside it and it drops on the laptop and the ball rolls out. So because we only have one take, we really want to make sure we get it right. We can't really test it for sure 100%. We don't know if it's going to work. First, let's just see what this looks like when a ball rolls across. Well, it's fine when there's no liquid there. So the best we can do is put in a fake laptop, like a block of wood, and see what happens when we roll a ball across it. Like this. Wow, it's still rolled. Okay, well that's what I expected. Go, little car, go. Yes. Okay. Oh my god. Ha <laughs> ha, cute. Yes! Woo! <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Yeah! The computer's still working. That was amazing! Oh my god. Yeah. Oh, it just died! Oh dear. Okay, well, let's at least save the CD. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> it just suddenly went off. That was amazing. We got a ballerina. She's gonna turn and pull a string, which makes the cake rotate. And then we've also got a motor down here to make the Lazy Susan rotate. <laughs> Great! It's so good! <laughs> we need to robustify it all. It's amazing! They're right turning! How good is this timing? That looked pretty good. Beautiful! Ooh, red is perfect. Okay. Yellow is perfect. It's so exciting. Is it gonna work? <laughs> Maybe. Yes! Hey! Yes! <laughs> That's all three. Amazing! Finale candle in place. Things are still moving. And... Things drop. Action happens. Stuff moves. Okay, so we're making a funnel for the ball to go through with a donut. This is a nice big donut hole in it, but to make it even easier, so when it lands here and still rolls in, I'm gonna carve into it, sort of, so it becomes more like a funnel. Now we're gonna ice it, but we don't wanna use real icing because the ball will get sticky from the icing. So we're gonna put a paint. We are about to do the first test of the candle burning. So we want to make sure, first of all, that it doesn't burn prematurely when the candles go underneath the rope and we want to see what it looks like when it does actually burn properly. We also want to see if it actually creates smoke to draw your eye back to this string. Okay, this is a little bit scary. Looks good, the candles are passing through without burning. Oh shoot, we've got flames guys. Oh, it went out, how bizarre. <laughs> 
So what? here's the final position. But they kind of worked. It burned properly, but I we need to rethink this. This is our birthday cake, and my roommate graciously made it for us. It's a very low profile cake so that it fits in the machine, and we're just gonna pop it over this piece of cardboard. I have to carve a hole in the bottom for the candle base to go in. So look at that, that's where the candle actually attaches. So those wood, little wooden bases are where the candles actually stick into, and they're just there so the timing can be absolutely perfect and as precise as possible. We actually did get it to work yesterday, although we weren't totally satisfied with the timing of the burning string at the very end. We tried to kind of convince ourselves that it was okay enough, but we just weren't satisfied. We decided to come back today and try again. So this is day two, and we just finished getting a much better working take that we're very happy with. So now it is time for cleanup. We've made a huge mess over here. There's like crumbs everywhere, chocolate, sugar, flour, sprinkles. I don't want to get mice in my room again. So to make the table flip 180 degrees, I actually had to replace two of the legs. So see this leg here? It's a much stronger leg than the other leg. So that way it won't snap because it's quite a violent action. Not only that, but it's also not all the way at the edge here like that leg is. It's in a little bit. And what that means is that it's easier for this to tip. It tips more easily than if the leg was all the way out here, because you've got more leverage. I also put these padded blocks here to catch the table, and there's all this hidden padding under the, the mat, so that I don't end up with holes in my floor. Then there's these hooks at the end that catch the weight, and they're connected by strings that go under the tablecloth, and they're actually tied really securely to the table. So when this is pulled on with the heavy weight, it tips. Last of all, I have this tube attached to the back legs. And there we have a little blue ball waiting to roll when the table flips. Thanks for watching! If you liked the video, leave a comment down below telling me what you thought, and subscribe to my channel. If you're watching this video, you're probably already subscribed to Joseph's Machines, but if you're not, you can subscribe right here. If you'd like to go back and watch the main video again, you can click right here, and if you'd like an even more detailed deep dive into this video, Joseph and I did an episode of Making Connections Together, which you can watch right here. I'm Jack of All Spades 98 and I'll see you in the next video.